All right, so we have uh, Arvind Prabhakar and Kathleen Ting back on track five, and they're going to talk about Scoop. Thank you. Apache Scoop was created to efficiently transfer bulk data from structured data sources, external structured data sources, into Hadoop because databases are not easily accessible <coughs> by Hadoop. The popularity of Scoop in enterprise systems confirms that Scoop does bulk transfer admirably. That said, there are certain data integration use cases um, that Scoop needs to address, as well as become easier to manage and operate. Who are we? Arvin Prabhakar is a Apache Scoop committer, PMC chair, and ASF member. Um, earlier, he, he gave a talk on Flume as well. Um, he's also an engineering manager at Cloudera, and I also am a, a Scoop committer and PMC member. Um, earlier I gave a talk on Hadoop, and I am a customer operations engineer manager at Cloudera. Um, and um, what is Scoop? Scoop is an Apache top level project as of April of last year. It was originally conceived as a Scoop to, sorry, as a sequel to Hadoop hence the name Scoop, as a SQL to Hadoop um, tool. Um, and and it, was, it was born out of the frustration of, of there not being anything readily available to import large amounts of data um, from your external data store, such as MySQL, um, Oracle, et cetera, originally just for MySQL, but the scope has since expanded. Um, there's nothing out there that could easily um, export from um, your, your external system into Hadoop for processing, and then once you're done with analysis, exporting it back out to your data store. Um, with Scoop, you can automatically populate your tables in HDFS, um, in Hive, in HBase. Um, there are command options that you can provide to do that. So, um, can you guys hear me? So, um, the rationale behind Scoop, you know, part of what Kathleen just uh, alluded to, um, goes pretty deep. You, you, if you if you are going to be running analytics uh, jobs in your Hadoop cluster in your in your pipeline, it's important that you be able to um, get data in there to begin with. And while you know in the earlier uh, session we talked about Flume, that's one way of getting data in there. Fact of the matter is, for the most part, enterprises are heavily invested in structured data stores. Um, so having a system um, like you know a MapReduce program go directly against your production databases, uh, even though that's doable, it's probably not the best thing to do um, because you do not want to unleash a cluster going against your crit business critical application databases. Um, so what Scoop does is it, it takes out that information that's buried in your relational stores, uh, your production databases, makes it available on HDFS or HBase or wherever you need it to be, um, and, and effectively decouples your Hadoop workload from your other business critical production applications. So that, that was the primary motivation of why Scoop was you know, uh, conceived in the first place. But other than that, you know, uh, the, the moment we started uh, uh, exploring this use case, we figured that uh, there is this huge discrepancy between the type systems that exist in the databases. Well, I mean, to be honest, there is a huge discrepancy within databases. Um, but there's more so between the combined you know, structured stores as well as Hadoop, because Hadoop's been perceived more um, from a different point of view than where the structured data stores are coming from. So another aspect that Scoop does very well and, and, and has factored into the motivation of sort of expanding the scope of Scoop and covering is the ability to do data type mapping and conversion across these disparate sources. Um, and then part of this data type you know, conversion across sources also requires the propagation of metadata, um, which is to say that, hey, if you have, um, you know, um, let's say an Oracle database that has um, a, a number data type uh, in a specific column, uh, and you would like that number data type to be expressed as a different data type within Hadoop, um, if you were to be on your own, uh, it'll require quite a considerable amount of manual labor work uh, in order for you to make that happen. 
what Scoop does is, you know, you, you run a command, basically it understands, it has intelligent default mappings and you can override them, populates it into Hadoop, whatever uh, system on Hadoop that you're running, um, maybe creates a table in high for you and gets that data available for you. And all of this, uh, while utilizing the maximum network capacity, giving you the ability to control when you want to run that load, um, and, and, you know, in, in a manner that's really high performant. As Arfin mentioned, Scoop 1 was conceived as a command line tool. And as such, there are 60 or so options that you can pass in as command line options um, for, for your Scoop job. So everything from um, dealing with your, your job data to, to dealing with the metadata um, that you need to pass it so it can connect successfully to your database. So such things as your username, your password, um, the, the connect URL, et cetera. Um, so the workflow of Scoop1 is um, you start from your client, um, you get your command input from the client, uh, which then um, connects and fetches the metadata from the database. Um, from there, um, Scoop will automatically create a, a map job for you. So it will generate code for you um, and then submit this map job um, to do the data transfer. So you don't need to, to write um, your own map job. It abstracts it away. You just provide the needed parameter so it can connect your database um, and then it will then, Scoop will then take over, um, generate the code, um, transfer your data. So um, to, to highlight one of the statements Kathleen made, um, Scoop 1 had 60 or odd command line options and, and those are the ones we could count. Um, you, you've got to think about this because if, if a system has 60 command line options, there's, there's something out of control there. Um, part of the rationale of why we needed the 60 command line options was because it was being rapidly developed for very specific use cases. This is normal evolution of software products. You know, they, they tend to expand scope tend to uh, encompass more and more use cases and then you know, sooner or later you have a realization that the initial design, initial assumptions weren't sufficient to make a case for incorporating those use cases. Um, happens all the time. So, but, but part of the matter is like you know, there, there's, there is a ceiling where once you get to it, um, it just becomes uh, very apparent that something needs to change. Um, apart from, apart from you know, the fact that the options were out of control, there's a very central theme of Scoop 1, which is it's entirely based on connectors. And connectors are these uh, little uh, extensions of the Scoop framework which bring in functionality specific to a certain data store. Uh, you could have a high performance, you know, we, we, uh, uh, Quest software, uh, which is now part of Dell, uh, developed a high performance connector for Oracle Exadata. Uh, it's called the Aura Oop. It's freely available. It's open sourced. Um, if you, if you go look at the code, it is by far non-trivial, not in terms of the uh, level of coupling and understanding and, and manipulation that it brings on the Oracle side, but equally important on, on the Scoop side. Uh, these connectors um, were the extension points that the framework came with, and, and we saw development of a bunch of connectors. Um, part, of, part of the shortcomings of this framework was um, if any of those options uh, that Scoop already supported weren't applicable to what these connectors were trying to do. They'd have to, you know, somehow work their way around it. And I'm sure Kathleen has uh, a little bit more details on that. Um, apart from that, there's there's overlap of functionality. Each connector uh, that supports, say, populating data in Edgebase will have to implement it, its own version of that. Um, as Arvin alluded to. And as you can tell from what we've said so far, and I'm sure if for those of you who have used Scoop, these challenges are not new. The cryptic and contextual command line arguments. One example is the driver option. This is something that trips users up on a regular basis. When you specify the driver option on your Scoop command line, what do you think will happen? You're gonna think, well, I'm gonna specify, I'm gonna take the trouble of specifying a driver option. Therefore, I'm telling you, Scoop, look, I want you to use a specialized connector, right? Why else would I specify a driver option? But actually, in a very non-intuitive fashion, if you specify the driver option, Scoop will then use the generic driver. Even if you have 
the specialized um, connectors such as or OOP for Oracle um, in your library, or if you have the Natiza connector or the, uh, the Teradata connector in your library correctly configured and installed, when you specify the driver option, you're actually using the generic JDBC, right? You're not getting the performance benefits and the added functionality of that specialized connector. Um, so, um, you know, definitely something that um, is, is not intuitive and, and a pain point for many. Security concerns. Scoop is, is a great tool, but it's a great tool that many users cannot use currently. Um, this is primarily people who work for a financial services company, um, anyone who cares about data confidentiality. Right now, your um, username and your password to your external database, your Oracle database, your Antiza database, it's being um, openly shared. Um, it, it is exposed. And as a result, um, you know, many people are not able to use Scoop as it is, even though um, it's a very functional, a very great tool because of the security concerns, um, the need for all clients to know credentials to the database, um, that's keeping um, Scoop from being more widely adopted. Currently, Scoop 1 from being widely adopted. Um, furthermore, some connectors may support a certain data format that others don't. For instance, the direct MySQL connector can't support sequence files. Um, Scoop users shouldn't need to concern themselves with Scoop administrator responsibilities, and that's something right now as a Scoop user, um, not only do you need to worry about what are the 60 or so options I need to provide, um, there, there is no, currently there's no way um, to, to know that. For instance, you know, if I'm trying to run um, in, in the direct mode, I can't use columns. Right. Um, if you really look into code, you would see a comment saying you can't do that, but um, you know, that's, that's too much to expect of the typical Scoop user. Um, um, and, and finally, as, as Arvind mentioned, currently the JDBC model is enforced, um, which made sense if you think about how Scoop was inten intended originally to import um, from MySQL into Hadoop and export back into MySQL. It made sense that you would have this overriding, overarching JDBC model that was enforced, but you know, we now have not just Oracle database connectivity, but we also have Natiza and Couchbase. And for those of you familiar with Couchbase, there is no, um, there is no concept of a table. But since Scoop um, is restricted to a JDBC vocabulary, um, the Couchbase connector is forced to use the table. But since there is no concept of a table, um, it instead, instead overloads the table name as a backfill or a dump operation, which again is not intuitive that you have this table option, dash dash table, which is actually um, operating disguised as a backfill or dump operation. Um, and this is a direct result of the JDBC model um, being enforced. So um, that, you know, it, it, to sum it up, like, you, you might be wondering, like, you know, well, how come uh, Scoop 1 have, has these challenges? Like, why wasn't it thought through uh, right from the get-go about, you know, enforcing a specific connectivity model, you know, enforcing a specific vocabulary? The answer is pretty simple. It's, it was developed. Um, as a hackathon project for power users by developers who were pained at the prospect of like doing manual dumps from one database into Hadoop to be able to run their MapReduce jobs. So for the longest time, Scoop1 kind of evolved more towards catering to the power user who's able to navigate their way around. And, and if you're one of those power users, you probably enjoy pain. Um, and, and that's the reason why you know it sustained uh, being applicable in the industry for such a long time. And it, it continues to fit those, those aspects even till today. Um, but, but the very nature of the kind of issues that Kathleen highlighted in the previous uh, slide leads on to a much bigger problem, which is the fact that connectors doing their own interpretation of the command line options, implementing functionality that is should ideally be shared, but you know, as, as a one-off, uh, leads to non-uniformity and an inconsistent user experience. That can um, put the brakes on um, you know, all new users trying to get familiarized with the tool, uh, be able to use it in production. Um, the implication of this is, uh, there is there is a usability aspect coupled with the security issues that Kathleen talked about. And, and it makes uh, scoop one as a product only accessible to a very small subset of users who are able to find their way around the space. There's, there's the other 
uh, angle to this whole problem, which is from the perspective of connector developers. Now, Scoop One has seen many, many connectors developed for it uh, from third-party vendors and, and you know uh, uh, database providers. Um, and I have personally interacted with a bunch of those um, and, and have guided them uh, to build these connectors. The one common theme that stands out is that most of these vendors do not do not quite understand the MapReduce model very well. Um, they are not familiar with the idiosyncrasies that Hadoop has, um, and it's a it's a struggle for them to a learn it um, and b keep up with it because it's changing. It's continuously evolving. Um, so those all fed into you know what we kind of sat down together and had had discussion. When I say sat down together in the Apache sense, it's on the mailing list. Um, and we had interesting discussions back and forth about what are, what are the various things we can do to change this. And, and, and that's basically ended up being um, sort of the, the seeding thoughts behind Scoop2. One of the seeding thoughts behind Scoop2 is to change up Scoop completely. Scoop1 has the Scoop client. Scoop2 has a client-server model. And by having this client-server model, Scoop2 is now a service in that you can install once and then run everywhere. This means that connectors can be um, stored in, in one place. They can be configured um, in one place, managed by the admin role, and run by the operator role, which we'll talk about later. Um, likewise, JDBC drivers are going to be one place. Database connectivity will only be needed on the server. So we're, we have server-side installation and configuration. Um, and, and as a result, the client interacts directly with the server, as you can see from this diagram. It doesn't interact with Hadoop. It doesn't interact with um, the database directly. The server um, takes care of all of that. Um, the server has a Metaso repository um, where you can store all of this job information um, for, for security and also for um, you know, for ease of use, so you don't have to you know, re-enter your connection parameters to your database over and over again. You don't need to worry about, um, is it safe, right? You don't want to give your password to your Oracle database out to everyone, right? You want that um, stored safely, um, and, and Scoop2 addresses that. Um, you know, we want to make sure uh, with Scoop that serialization, format conversion, um, and high event HBase integration, which we're lacking in Scoop 1, you know, we want these to be uniformly available via the Scoop 2 framework. So um, to sum that all up, uh, you know, it, it all kind of boils down to the key design goals behind Scoop 2 as an implementation. And here are the three key design goals that pretty much drove um, and they're still driving. Scoop2 is far from a complete product at the moment. We just made the first release of the upstream. Happened on December 25th last year. Um, but, you know, that said, there's, there's plenty of work to be done. All of that is guided in part by these three design goals uh, that we've set uh, f uh, in, in, in front of us to be able to meet them. The first is ease of use. So we talked about the 60 command line options, how they can contextually behave differently, how they can have an implied you know, effect on, on your uh, actual scoop job, uh, which may not be intuitive enough. So we want to get rid of all of that. We want to get all of the information, all regarding the functionality that the user uh, uh, is trying to achieve, right in front of the user in a way that is domain specific. Uh, doesn't necessarily require, uh, you know, the understanding of a JDBC model, for instance. Uh, if you, with Scoop2, are trying to import data from a couch-based database, uh, you wouldn't need to specify tables anymore. Um, that domain-specific interaction is key to a pleasant user experience because um, let's say, you know, contrasting the Scoop 1 case, um, if I have a production system which runs um, maybe in a Tesa uh, data warehouse, um, it's expected that I will, I will be familiar with the concepts in Nateza. It's expected that I'll be familiar with the various options that I need to specify in order to get connectivity with Nateza. However, um, if the system is a uniform system that is using like these cryptic options to figure out that, that functionality, it might force you to understand other warehousing systems like Teradata. Um, and they may not speak the same vocabulary. Um, a classic example of this is, you know, the notion of a schema is different in different databases. 
they, they have far-reaching uh, implications with respect to how security works in databases, uh, you know, how ownership and privileges work in databases. So Scoop2 tries and addresses a lot of this by having ease of use as one of the fundamental design goals. The second thing uh, that it does is, is it enables the same level of, of um, ease uh, for, for the connector developers as well. So ease of extensibility is also very, very important. One of the things we factored in was um, to create an abstraction, to create a framework that will keep the connector developers abstracted from the underlying um, changes in Hadoop. So, for example, with Scoop2, you know, one of one of the distributions, um, you know, uh, that 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 supports Scoop2 got released yesterday, uh, is is Cloudera's CDH uh, 4.2 distribution. In in that distribution, we we ship MR1 and we also ship Hadoop2, and Scoop will work with either one of them. Um, and the connector doesn't need to be coded for either MR1 or for Yarn, the, the Hadoop2 uh, MR system. So a lot of this is, is a, going to be a welcome change for connector developers who have always complained that, you know, we want to coexist in this ecosystem. We want to enable your enterprise workflows, but we don't quite understand a lot of these idiosyncrasies and details. And of course, the third one is security and separation of concerns um, that Kathleen mentioned, which we'll talk about in a minute. What happens when you submit a scoop job? You create a connection and then you submit a job. So for those of you who have submitted a scoop job, you, you know that out of the 60 or so options, um, you can parse those options into basically two distinct categories. The, the connection category and a job category. The connection category are things like your, your um, connect URL, your username, your password to your external data store. Um, and so that's going to be distinct per database. And then you have your job category, um, things like um, the table, um, the query, um, you know, the target dirt. Those are going to be distinct per table. Um, you know, this way, when the user um, makes an explicit connector choice, um, it will be less error prone and more predictable um, with, with Scoop2 in that, you know, no longer is, is Scoop going to guess for you based on your connect URL, what database you're trying to, um, you're trying to connect to. Instead, um, you're going to explicitly tell Scoop, right? And that will cut down a lot of the errors um, and make it more predictable as a result. Um, with Scoop2, users, they don't need to be aware of the functionality of other connectors, as Arvin mentioned. Um, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, the Couchbase users won't need to care um, that other connectors use tables, right? That's, that's going to be um, a non-relevant a non fact. Um, by having connections enabled as first class objects, which are going to encompass credentials, um, the user and passwords for your external data stores, you can create these connections once and then use them many times for various um, import and export jobs. Um, so your, your metadata will be saved in the server, which houses a metadata repository. So you don't have to first keep typing it, so you're going to be responsible for securing it as a result. So, um, so this, is, this is typically, uh, you know, uh, the, the current implementation, this is how it works with Scoop2. Um, and and uh, a part of it will become clear as we step into the second part of the session where we'll actually attempt a demo. Um, the key idea behind Scoop2 is that connectors bring in the metadata uh, that they operate with. And the term metadata gets thrown around in a lot of different you know, uh, aspects in a lot of different contexts. I want to clarify what it means here. Um, let's say we're developing a connector. So, so one of the connectors that Scoop2 currently ships with is the generic JDBC connector. And what the generic JDBC connector does is it allows you um, to, to take data, to move data from any database that supports JDBC you know, connectivity. Um, you, you've got to install the JDBC driver somewhere, and then uh, you should be able to use this connector to create a connection to the database, and then eventually create a job, uh, which may be of import type or export type, using that connection. So uh, this connector registers its metadata with the Scoop2 server, and, and that metadata would, would encompass all of the necessary things that this connector needs to establish the connection. So that could mean username and password and connect string, JDBC parameters, and so on and so forth. 
Um, so you'd be able to specify that, um, save it in the metadata repository that Scoop Server maintains, um, and that becomes a connection. And using you know this first class object, which was you know previously didn't quite exist, um, you could actually now create another set of objects, the job objects, which Kathleen alluded to in the previous slide, uh, which can all depend upon these connections. So this neatly ties back into the separation of concerns. Um, there is an that there, there is clearly, in an enterprise setting, uh, a different role that governs credentials and access uh, for various security impl implementation purposes. Um, so those will be the people, those administrators would be the people creating connection objects. And yet, there would be operators who would be able to go in um, and use these connection objects without necessarily knowing what are the credentials contained within, and then be able to modify them uh, uh, use them and, and, and to create their, their own jobs for importing and exporting. Um, so metadata enables creation of the connections and jobs. Um, they get stored in, in the metadata repository. Part of storing them in the metadata repository also benefits uh, you know, the user in that you know, once you configure a job, you don't have to keep typing it over and over again. You can just invoke the job um, anytime with you know, just a job ID. Um, and then you would run these jobs when you've when uh, on uh, appropriate times. Um, the goal is, you know, the separation of concern neatly ties into our projected security implementation where we'll be able to restrict access to these objects uh, based on different roles, whether it's an admin role or an operator role. Um, but also going one step beyond that, be able to set authorization and policies on top of these objects. So for instance, an admin can say, this connection object should not have more than four connections, which effectively translates to throttling the amount of load your production database will see. And that's a very huge requirement in most enterprises uh, that are trying to move data between production systems and their Hadoop cluster. Uh, you wouldn't want, uh, let's say, a, 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 you know, a malfunctioning uh, task tracker or a malfunctioning node in, in your cluster to kick in speculative execution and have more than n number of connections go at it together against your production database. So those kind of things become feasible with, with Scoop 2. Um, As Arvind mentioned, with Scoop 2, we're going to have support for secure access to external systems via this role-based access. So we're going to have two roles, the administrator role and the operator role. The administrator is responsible for creating, editing, and deleting these first class um, connection objects, and then the operator uses these connections. Um, this way we prevent misuse and abuse as well. Um, we, we can have these connections restricted in scope. So um, if, if a certain user only needs to do an import, you can have them, um, you can give them an import connection object, so they can only do imports. Um, and notice that you don't need to give them the password anymore um, in order to do an import. Um, or if they can only do an export, then you can give them a connection object that only allows them um, to do an, an export um, to, to the table. Um, so this is, this is more secure because you're routing through the Scoop server rather than opening up access to all clients to perform jobs. Where you previously in Scoop 1, we required direct access to Hive and HBase. Um, going forward, we no longer need this direct access, and therefore it's going to be significantly more secure. So to, to wrap it up, um, you know, when we talked about the design goals, we talked about the, the driving ideas. Um, here's how Scoop 2 addresses usability and extensibility in, in, in a nutshell. From a usability perspective, uh, we've identified you know, uh, uh, first class objects which matter to our, our users, the connections and the jobs. That's what they're mostly interested in. Uh, they are cleanly separated along uh, uh, responsibility boundaries. So there's separation of concerns, which e very, very well ties into the role-based uh, security model that we would like to implement on top of this product. Um, having it metadata driven through connectors allows us to make these objects very specific to the domain in which they operate. So if you're going against Natiza, you will be speaking Natiza vocabulary. If you're going against Oracle, you'll be speaking Oracle vocabulary and so on and so forth. Um, 
one of the things that Scoop2 does, the framework does, is it, and it requires that these connectors write data into what is called the intermediate data representation, um, which IDF um, or IDR. You would find plenty of discussion about this on our wiki page and, and on our mailing list. Uh, the basic idea behind this is um, that the connectors have a very well-specified minimal set of functionality that they need to address. Um, contrasting it with Scoop1, where the connectors were supposed expected to populate, say, HBase or Hive, uh, that's no longer needed <coughs> because all of that processing folds into the downstream functionality. Uh, so the connectors do the data transfer and the Scoop framework does the rest. So much more extensible from a connector development perspective. Uh, we expect a lot of vendors to jump in and help out and, and pick up like implementation of connectors. Um, definitely, their experience is going to be much better as to what their experience was contrasting with how they had the connectors roll out for Scoop 1. So with that, um, we will we'll attempt a demo. So I don't know if you guys know this, but demos usually don't work. So don't just just to set the level expectations. Uh, we'll try. All right, um, so this is my VM uh, on which I have uh, installed Hadoop. Um, so I'm actually using um, Cloudera's distribution um, of Apache Hadoop uh, 4.2 that got released um, on Tuesday, um, right um, off, off, the, off the press, fresh, fresh off the, the, the shelf. Um, if I, let me, if I, So I've got all my daemons running, um, all the, um, the data node. Uh, it's, it's a pseudo distributed installation that's running uh, solely on this VM. Um, if I do, can you guys read it? Do you want a bigger font? OK, so sorry. Any better? So these are the Hadoop demons that I just showed a moment ago. Um, so if I look at uh, what I have under HDFS, so I have you know uh, a directory for myself and a directory for root, um, and let's see what's under root. Not, there's nothing under root. It's, it's an empty directory. Now, on this very system, I also have installed Scoop2 Server and Scoop2 Client. So Scoop2 Server in CDS distribution comes as a package. You, you install that package, and it configures itself. There's, there's you know, some configuration you may need to override, depending upon how you've set CDH up. Um, but I've taken care of all of that. I'm not going to bore you guys with that detail. There, the documentation kind of walks you through that. Um, so one way by which I can make sure that the server's running is, all right, I can't get to the bottom bar. Sorry.
Oh, panels. Pardon me. So by default, the server runs on. Oh, it's not on, I guess. Oh. Yeah, I think I should mirror the display. Kathleen, you're a genius. Um. Much better. Okay, so there it is. I have, um, you know, the server running. This is a dummy page. Um, the actual scoop logic, the the the, the server logic sits under the context uh, root called scoop, and then I can query what version it's running by doing this. So. Here I have, um, you know, I have a protocol revision one. This is the date, um, so on and so forth. Um, there, there is another way of, of accessing this information, which is via the scoop client. So I can start the scoop client by just uh, typing scoop2. Um, I can do, I can associate this client with a specific server. I can say set server minus minus host localhost, and then I can do show version all. So here it is. It actually shows me the server version is 199.1 uh, CDH420, and the client version is also 199.1. The reason why it's 199.1 is because we weren't ready to call it Scoop2 yet. Um, it's, it's getting close. Now, as I mentioned, what the server does is it actually enables um, connectors to register the metadata, and by default, there is one connector that ships with Scoop Server, is, uh, which is a generic JDBC connector. So I'm just going to query the server using this tool to see if uh, that connector is there. So a bunch of stuff got printed out. Uh, mostly, it is all metadata. So here was the command I typed, scoop connector minus um, all, show show connector minus all. It says one connector to show. And the connector with ID one is the generic JDBC connector. So that's the connector we will use. Um, I also want to show you guys that I don't have any jobs or any connections uh, at the moment. So show connection minus minus all, zero connections to show. Um, show job minus minus all, there are no jobs. So the first thing I'll do is I'll create a connection. And this connection will go against a MySQL database. Um, I, for that purpose, I have the MySQL database uh, set up already. Let's see. So I've got a table called intro, and it has some data. So here's the intro table. It's, it's all, all the cities, uh, all of my favorite cities. Um, and this will be the table we'll try to move into Hadoop uh, through Scoop using, using the Scoop2 system. So the first thing to do is to create a connection for this. So we will do create connection minus minus CID uh, that's the short for connector ID. Connections are tied to connectors. And the connector ID is one. We just saw the generic JDBC connector has the ID one. So please fill the following values. The name is demo connection. The JDBC driver class for, will be for uh, MySQL, com MySQL JDBC driver. And the connect string would be um, JDBC colon my SQL colon slash slash local host 
scoop. That's, uh, that's my database name, scoop. And the username is scoop user, and password is password. Did I type in right? We'll find it out. Uh, max connections four. Um, so now, a uh, new connection was successfully created with validation status find persist 93. Um, let me see if I can update uh, connection. All right, updating connection. So, so this allows me to go edit these objects. Um, I'm updating demo connection. The driver class is this. Uh, the connect string is this. Username this. Password. This time I should type it right. Yay. Max connections for. So connection was up updated successfully. Now the next thing I'll do is I'll create a job. So create job with connection ID, XID, because we couldn't use CID, so it was XID. Uh, the connection ID is three, because uh, that's, that's the connection we're going to be using with this job. Uh, minus, minus type, import. We're trying to import data. Um, and the import, like import and export are Hadoop-centric, so when you say import, it's moving data into Hadoop, export is moving data out of Hadoop. Um, so the name is uh, demo job. Uh, the table name is intro. Uh, we don't need a SQL query. We don't need to specify columns or partitions or boundaries. Um, so there's one storage type con available in the server, which is HDFS. So we'll use that. And we will output uh, our format as a text file. And the output directory will be user root intro. Um, that's for th throttling, and we don't have to enter any values there. So we got a new job created with uh, ID3. So I have my um, Hadoop uh, daemons running here, which we can query. So that's my local MR uh, job tracker. I'm going to launch this job now and hope for the best. So that's my job ID three. I'm going to submit it and um, request starting of that submission. So the status is booting. I can query the status of this job anytime. I can say submission uh, status minus minus JID three. And it says running. I'll probably see it here. Yep, there is this job ID running. This is the same ID 003 that you see over here. So that's the external job ID. And there you go. Uh, the job actually succeeded. Remarkable. Um, all right, so, so the job succeeded. And um, yeah, the, you know, there were four mappers. Uh, the map total for um, that was the number of connections that it spawned out. Um, so we go back to our. Um, uh, command line to see whether the data actually moved. So uh, Hadoop FS minus LS user root. Now there is a directory called intro. And let's see what's inside the intro directory. Oh, there are so many files. Uh, maybe we should try and cat them. That's the data, text format done on the server side. So it actually worked. That's it. Go back to the presentation. Thanks, Arvind, for a very successful demo. <laughs> the current status of Scoop 2 is that we have a first cutout, as, as Arvind mentioned. It was a, a Christmas gift um, for all of us in the community. Um, bits and docs are up at scoop.apache.org. 
um, Scoop2 is, is the primary focus of the, the Scoop community, and we welcome your feedback, we welcome your suggestions, and most importantly, we need you, we want you to contribute um, code, docs, use cases, um, you know, you name it, we want it. This is a significant re-architecture of Scoop um, for the better. And it's only going to be better if the community can assist. Um, I, I think that's the beauty of Apache, and um, I look forward to your contributions. Open to questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, can, I, can repeat. I just had a question. Now that you've moved to like a client server model, so what kind of you know when it comes to like scaling, like how what you know what, what kind of models there on the server side? Like you know, is it like master slave plans or you know what kind of redundancy are you going to have? Is that part of the plan, or is it already there? Sure. So the question is, uh, what's the the scalability model uh, now that Scoop is transitioning over into the client server uh, uh, landscape? So that. To answer that question, um, one of, that's been one of the primary uh, underlying uh, goals for the implementation. So as a result, we don't have any state management. You know, it's a completely stateless server. All of the state is externalized to the metadata repository, which allows us to have multiple instances of Scoop server if you need to scale out. Um, so that's basically the model we're following. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the question is, with the move towards um, uh, the different roles uh, for administrators and operators, would there be different number of connections necessary for different users? Is that, did I? So, so if you have like two or three groups of people that have different connections, uh, and you don't want them to share connections, okay. and you have different administrators per group. Uh, okay. So the question is, can we have like a fine grain access at the administrative level for different groups of, at this point in time, it's, you know, we don't have the first cut yet. So it could shape up either way. And I think the best way you can drive it towards your specific requirements by being active on the community mailing list um, and sending in these requirements. Uh, I think the first cut that we will try to implement would be fairly um, straightforward in that there would be one admin role and one operator role. Any more finer grain uh, uh, segregation would probably evolve over a period of time. Sorry. Uh, you had a question? So where is the possible to say to you the administrator to make a connector and the administrator must to keep the username and password? So where is the username and password? Okay. So the question is, uh, where does the administrator's username and password validated or used uh, or stored? Um, so Scoop would not do user management. Uh, Scoop is not in the business uh, for, for doing the actual security and, and user management aspects of a secure system. All of that we expect uh, to be part of the homogeneous security infrastructure across Hadoop-related projects, which at this point in time is Kerberos. Um, so we would expect the users to use Kerberos. Uh, that would be the first cut implementation. There's been some discussion about it. Uh, we'd expect the, the administrators to uh, sign in use, using their specific credentials using K in it or whatever they use. Um, and then from that point onwards, Scoop will be able to pick up that token um, and then propagate that. So it's much, much like how Scoop 1 enables Kerberos integration today. Sorry, my question is the administrator, he can uh, create a connector for the operation to use. Okay. So the, uh, the connector you your demo, you put in the to ZDBC's uh, username and password. Yes. So the U ZDBC's username and password is stored in the connector. Yes, in, in the connection object. So okay. in the demo, the connection object stored the username and password needed for the JDBC connectivity. Uh, what you didn't see in this demo is uh, the fact that th there are two separate roles, you know, because that's not implemented yet. But the connection edits and modifications will be only accessible to admins. 
uh, the operators will only be able to use the connections. So the connection object is safe in the database or the file system or? Yes, the connection object is safely kept in the database, the metadata repository. Currents could be used as an EPL regularly snort the latest updates. So the, so the question is, can Scoop be used as ETL uh, for regular ingests from um, online databases? Uh, this is a loaded question. Uh, the, the term ETL is fairly um, um, heavy scoped in terms of you, you, ETL means different things to different enterprises. Um, I, you know, I, if, you, if you compare Scoop with a system like Informatica, probably not. Scoop is not gonna go uh, into that segment of, of, of market. Uh, but there are times when minor data modifications are necessary in order for making them available for the downstream processing. I'll give you an example. And this, always, this also happens with Scoop One. Um, people use Hive, people use external databases. Eventually, they would like to run uh, queries in their Hive uh, uh, warehouse. Um, these queries require the data to be available within Hive. And people would use Scoop One to, to transmit this data from, from their external uh, data stores into, in, into um, Hive, Hive Warehouse. The problem is that external data stores can deal with things uh, such as new line characters happening within string data that Hive cannot. There's a very, very good example. There's a lot of, lot of users out there who have data that has new line characters in it. And Hive will just break because new lines are rec record terminators for Hive no matter what. Uh, if it's text-oriented data. So Scoop comes with options to filter those things out uh, that you can consider as an inline transformation. And if that's an inline transformation, you could argue that that's effectively ETL. But that's a very, I mean, that's a negligible aspect of ETL. Uh, that's probably doesn't even merit itself being associated with ETL. It's more like data preparation. Uh, so yes, Scoop will be doing data preparation in order for it to become more accessible to downstream systems, uh, but not quite in that ETL manner. Right, so just to, to tag on to what Arvind was saying, Scoop originally was meant to be a transfer tool, and Scoop 2 is going to continue to be um, for transfer purposes, but with more of a service aspect. Um, so what we've discussed here today with Scoop 2 and what you can play around with with the first cut of Scoop 2 um, is it's going to be easier to use. It's going to be easier to develop connectors on. It's going to be more secure. But at the end of the day, Scoop's um, charter is to be a transfer tool. Um, and so as a result, the, the scope of, of being an ETL is, is beyond. That's to be on the scope of Scoop 1 and Scoop 2. So the question is, um, have there been any use cases for doing encryption over data as it's transferred? Um, yes and no. Uh, I, I, yes, because the people have expressed concerns about uh, you know, the fact that um, data that is transferred by Scoop becomes accessible pretty much immediately uh, to any processes that are running as a Scoop you know, user, whoever is running Scoop. So, uh, things like obfuscation was requested in the community. There, there, there's some mail records for that, but I don't think we have implemented any of that yet. And again, you know, um, as the case with any functionality, no matter how small or big, patches are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, to, to tag, um, tag along of what Arvind said there as well, um, what, what I've noticed with um, so I, I'm also a Scoop subject matter expert at Cloudera, and most of, of the Scoop issues that I've seen uh, in regards to security are primarily, um, to your earlier question, about um, um, obfuscating the password um, rather than the data. Because um, it, it seems to be that's, that's kind of beyond the, the scope of Scoop. Um, and, and you know, securing the data is more of, you know, Oracle's worry or, or um, you know, Hadoop's worry, right? But um, just making sure that the password is safe. Um, that's the, the, the number one security concern I see. Uh, Mark, that's a really great use case. Um, I look forward to Jerry, you're gonna file for that. But that's not something we commonly see. Any more questions? Uh, uh, suppose, uh, the 
database, you have a billion records. You, you have to create a, a job to many jobs to run like a partial data at a time, or, or do you just have to do one one? Uh, so, um, so the question is, uh, if you have a million record table or more in a database, uh, do you have to partition it into multiple jobs or not? Uh, the answer is no. Scoop takes care of that. Um, you will be able to, you know, when, 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 if you remember when we were creating the connection object, um, there, there was the number of connections uh, that was specified as, as the maximum. And Scoop will allow, the framework will allow the number of mappers to expand to that in order to parallelize the import of large data sets. Um, Scoop. But, but you don't have to select some data one time from database to your memory, right? Uh, it's a streaming system. Okay. So, and and it, it also is a function of what the connector does. Different connectors, uh, there, there are direct connectors that exist for Scoop 1 that don't, they haven't yet been coded for Scoop 2, but those connectors use native utilities that the database provides, like you know, MySQL dump, for example. It's extremely fast and very well optimized for the internal formats that MySQL uses. So if you have a sharded instance of like a table that spans across, you know, maybe, maybe 100 nodes, uh, which, which has like many millions of rows of data, using MySQL dump would make sure that the discovery and management and transport of the data is done in the most optimal manner. And Scoop will ensure that it's, it's, it's invoking the MySQL dump processes in as many nodes as you've specified it to scale with. So effectively, it's, it's, it's a self-managing system for the most part. You, would, you, you can tune it and tweak it. Right, so uh, along, along those lines, um, we're, we're done. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can take it offline. All right, thank you, everyone. Appreciate you all.